This is part two of managing hosts with vSphere client. If we click over to advanced settings, it's called direct path, where we can actually associate physical cards in the host with a VM directly. So we could actually present a PCI device directly to a virtual machine. Now, typically this is not going to be required, but if you have something specialized or something where the virtual machine really needs the performance of having access to the device directly, it is possible to do that. In this case, we'll configure it here. We're not really going to look at this in the course, but VMware has some excellent documentation on it. If I click over to power management, this particular setup that I'm using doesn't support power management, but we could configure it here. And if you go into the properties, you'll have the ability to set your power policy. Now, by default, it's going to be balanced, which should be reasonably appropriate for most environments. If you'd like to get even better power savings, we could go more conservative. Or if we wanted to get better performance, we could be more aggressive. This is all quite interesting, but when we start looking at the distributed resource scheduler later, we also have distributed power management, and we can actually do power management at the cluster level on a large scale with large numbers of hosts participating in making sure that enough resources are available to meet a particular workload, but shutting down or putting to sleep servers that aren't required. And then as workload increases, then we can wake those machines up and actually distribute workload to them using the distributed resource scheduler. And we're going to talk about all that in the DRS and DPM videos later on. So we've got a whole other section below here for software. If we go down to software, you'll see we've got license features. I'm running in evaluation mode, so effectively I've got access to all the features. Once we've decided what features we really need and what we don't, and which edition of VMware best meets those needs, standard or enterprise or enterprise plus, then we can go ahead and acquire the license and go ahead here and click edit and then provide the license directly. It's true, you can get a free license key for ESXi. There's limitations that come with that. And of course, lots of features that aren't included. But you will need to go on VMware's website. You will need to register for it. They'll provide you a key, and then you'll have to provide it here. At this point, I'm running in evaluation mode of Enterprise Edition. If I register for the free version of ESXi, then I'm going to be running in a much more limited environment. Less access to resources, less features, and not able to be managed by vCenter and do all that cool distributed resource scheduling, distributed power management stuff I was talking about before. I'm not going to provide a license here anyway, since I don't have one to provide it. When you go to set up an actual production environment, though, what you're typically going to do is use vCenter to provide the licenses to your hosts, and then we have centralized management of licensing. just makes life potentially easier. Although, then we have a dependency on vCenter for the licensing. I can set up time sync with an external source, potentially with domain controllers, or with a router, or an external NTP server, or maybe even a GPS clock that's installed on your network, or process controls or something like that in an industrial environment. Timekeeping is very important in an Active Directory environment. They've made substantial improvements in VMware 5.1 to make timekeeping more accurate. I definitely recommend that you review the VMware timekeeping document out on VMware's website, and I'll provide a link to that in the additional reading. Now, VMware Tools does provide VMware time sync. Traditionally, that's been a little bit difficult to use correctly, but they've cleaned that up quite a bit in 5.1. Under DNS and routing, we can set the local host name as well as the domain suffix. We can provide the DNS server details and also our default gateways. So if I go into properties here, you can see that it's quite easy to just provide the details as needed. And we don't have to go on to the shell or the DCUI interface to do that. Now, typically, if you're operating in an Active Directory environment and you have a Windows-based infrastructure, then there's a very good chance that you're going to want to integrate either your ESXi hosts directly with Active Directory or through vCenter. Typically, vCenter, being traditionally a Windows service, would handle a lot of the domain integration for us. In more recent versions of VMware, we can actually now connect VMware directly to Active Directory. And you can see that we can actually move from local authentication to Active Directory-based authentication probably going to be easier generally to do this with vCenter. And again, if you've virtualized your Active Directory environment and you don't remember to keep some domain controllers outside of your virtual environment, we may run into a bootstrapping problem when we have to bring the environment up and get it all working. Now as well, if you've set up a proper SSL certificate for your hosts, not just in order to avoid the warning that you get typically when you connect, if you've generated a proper SSL certificate for this host, you can go ahead and import it here as well. Now, if we take a look over at virtual machine startup and shutdown, I don't have any virtual machines registered yet, but what we can do is specify that if we power up the host, that the virtual machines running on it should come up automatically. 
in a clustered environment, if we're using VMware HA and if we're using DRS and so on, we may have an easy way to have that virtual machine brought up automatically or moved automatically before the host that it's running on is shut down. When you're running in a clustered mode, you can't really use these options. These options are not really available at the cluster level either, so we'll talk about that more in the later videos. If you go into the properties, you can just say whether or not you want to allow them to start and stop, and then we can say which ones start up automatically and which ones start up in any order after the initial priority startup, and then which ones will be started up manually. Set some swap file settings. Place the swap file for the system on a particular data store. Access the firewall settings as well as the services settings for the host, and we're going to take a look at this in some later videos. If you have local solid state storage, you can also configure local host caching based on solid state based data stores. You can also set a little bit of system resource allocation. And we've got these agent VM settings, which we don't really ever get into in this series. We can also set various advanced settings here as needed. So now that we've seen the configuration section, we can also view a little bit of details on the local users and groups. We'll see this in a later video. You can also view the events associated with the system which is separate from the log files, which we'll take a look at in a later video, also permissions. So the one thing I said I would do was import the virtual machine. I've got one sitting out on my data store. If I go into my configuration and go to storage, you can right click the data store and say browse. And from there, you'll see that I've got a folder that has some installation ISOs that I'm going to use and also has a folder for my virtual machine. The VMX file, basically describes the virtual machine or has all the settings associated with the virtual machine. And if I right click on it, I can say add to inventory. And you'll see that it gives me the option to provide the name that I want to use for it, what host I want to place it on. I can go ahead and have it registered there. And then I could simply power that virtual machine on and start interacting with it or modify its settings as needed. So we're going to see all that in a later video. This gives us a pretty good idea of what we can use the vSphere client for. This is definitely the tool that you're going to spend by far the majority of your time in for your work with VMware. In the next few videos, we're going to start taking a look at some of those specific areas that we can configure, such as networking and storage and configuring virtual machines and so on.